I'm Robert Olin Butler, and I'm speaking to you tonight um, in our, what is this, our 15th session of um, Inside Creative Writing, 16th. This is number 16, time flies. Um, and I'm talking to you from, as I have been uh, all along, from my office at Florida State University, where I teach creative writing. And um, <clears throat> we've been in the midst here, and in fact, we're drawing to the near to the end of uh, a rather special experiment. Um, I'm feeling uh, if I sound a little wobbly here tonight, it's because I am. This has been a grueling uh, couple of weeks, but uh, well worth it. On October 30th, I began these webcasts two hours every night except for a Saturday nights and I just will remind you that tomorrow night we will not have a webcast though we will uh, night after tomorrow on Sunday but I began on October 30th with an old picture postcard a picture postcard of a photo a real photo taken by someone on the ground looking up at an, a, a fragile biplane falling, about to fall, um, in 1913. And from that photo and the few words written on the back, uh, I have written a short story uh, in these webcasts, absolutely from scratch. I prepared nothing in advance. I have prepared nothing, written not a word outside of your presence uh, with these webcasts. And last night, we finally reached uh, what I feel confident now, and we'll re-examine it tonight, of course, but I feel confident was the, the, um, the ending, the organic finishing of, the, of this object, this short story. Well, I'm glad you're with me tonight, and I have a strong suspicion that we are tonight with our hardcore group, and, uh, and I sincerely appreciate your uh, faithfulness in, in tuning in, following uh, this story, and your um, very kind and very thoughtful and very perceptive comments and questions that you've been offering to me uh, as I've been going along. It's helped a lot. Um, in that regard, in case you are viewing tonight for the first time, and there may well be some of you, um, we have gotten very interesting recent publicity. So if you're viewing tonight for the first time, let me tell you how to catch up, because you, you've not missed anything, really, uh, other than just the idea that it's happening live. Well, what happened live is out there virtually live, uh, in the archives of Inside Creative Writing here uh, at Florida State University. All you have to do is go back to the Inside Creative Writing homepage through which you entered this very um, webcast you're watching right now. And you'll find toward the bottom half of the page a large calendar and on it the days that we have done this webcast and you can click on your connection speed in any given day and you will be able to play in full, at your leisure, um, anytime you wish, the, uh, the, um, the webcast for that evening, the full two hours of it. You can also, in the date boxes of that calendar, you can, you can see where the story stood at the end of each of those webcasts. Toward the top of the page, you'll find eventually... Uh, soon uh, a way to read the full complete edited final story you'll also be able to look at that picture postcard image that I, I mentioned to you you can see it very clearly the uh, f this biplane with its wing tearing away and the message on the back saying this is Earl Sant of Erie Pennsylvania in his aeroplane just before it fell 
and very important, and it's becoming crucially, uh, increasingly important because um, our sessions together are drawing to a close, and that is the opportunity to email me. Uh, as you, if you've been tuning in, you'll know that I spend the last half hour every evening answering your questions and um, engaging your comments on what's been written so far. And I encourage you to do that uh, tonight and over the weekend. Our pattern tonight will be this. We're going to, I'm going to um, go through the story now one more time off the screen of my computer. We'll look it over together very carefully and do final, at this point, line editing. I think that's all that's needed at, at, this, pl at this point. Um, we're, we're down to the, the final polishing and line editing. We'll do that tonight, and that will not take as long as um, the creative output of the previous sessions, I don't think, unless we run into some tricky line editing problems. But barring that, I think we'll have time tonight for probably more questions than we usually do. And then, I'm glad I have tomorrow night, the Saturday night off, and that's uh, November 17th. And then on Sunday the 18th, we'll come back for our 17th session and final session. Now what's going to happen, and this is part of the process, and that's of course the whole point of this project has been to share with you the, in its fullness, in, the, in its full moment-to-moment -moment particularity, the creative process as it has previously happened only behind, shrouded behind the, the veil of private life. And one of the things about the process is that I do, especially toward the end now, I will do more reading of the work in, in search of line editing and whatever final touch-ups need to be made. I will read the work not off the computer screen, uh, although I do that too, but there will certainly be some stages in which I will be reading the text uh, printed out. And so on Sunday late afternoon, early evening, I will read through the text of the story one more time in the form of printed text. And of course, I will do that off camera so you don't just sit there watching me silently read to myself. But you can imagine me doing that. Whatever line editing problems I will see, I will mark the spot and I will bring those in then, and I'll solve those problems before you at the beginning of our Sunday session. I don't expect there to be very much of that. And then I will, um, I will read the story to you one last time. Not off the computer screen, but here directly, face to face, as if, for example, the story had appeared in a book, which someday it will, I'm writing a book of these short stories based on these old picture postcards. Um, my next book is a book called Fair Warning. Forgive me for one more plug here, which will be coming out uh, in January. But the next book I do after that will be this book of stories, most likely. So the reading I will give very near the beginning of our Sunday session will be a reading of the story from the text to you, the printed text, as if you had come to hear me uh, in a concert reading in a, at a university, or, uh, a, my, or if I were giving a reading in a bookstore, and you'd come to hear me read. Uh, I will read to you the beginning of our Sunday session in that way. And then uh, I will spend the rest of our Sunday uh, trying to get through the, as many of the questions as I possibly can that you uh, have asked me that I've not dealt with yet 
or that you will ask me between now and Sunday. So it's going to be a big question and answer day on Sunday. So I particularly encourage you then, between now and Sunday early evening, to write me any final questions that you have about the creative process, about writing in general, about uh, anything that, that you feel I might be able to answer for you in, in terms of the creation of fiction that has a serious artistic ambition to it. It doesn't mean the story has to be serious. Um, those of you who know my work, more broadly, I have written books that are, in fact, I'm told, uh, quite funny in many ways. Uh, Tabloid Dreams, a book of short stories that I wrote using the, um, taking headlines out of uh, the touchstone instead of old picture postcards where the headlines uh, out of newspapers like the Weekly World News and The Sun. I wrote short stories entitled things like uh, Titanic Victim Speaks Through Waterbed and uh, a uh, jealous husband returns in form of parrot, and and I, I scooped the the tabloids too. I got a lot of stories that they didn't get, like um, woman uses glass eye to spy on philandering husband, and uh, uh, JFK secretly attends Jackie auction. These are the s short stories from Tabloid Dreams. Mister Spaceman, my uh, last novel has a lot of humor in it, as does um, Fair Warning, by the way. But this story tonight uh, that we're going to work over again uh, came from quite a different vision in me. And uh, you'll see why. And, and as a matter of fact, the two previous postcard stories I wrote, one of which has appeared in Hemispheres magazine, the United Airlines in-flight magazine, and one of which is still to come in hemispheres. Those, both those stories have a fair amount of humor in them as well. Some of these picture postcards have yielded already very funny stories, but tonight's is, is from a different place. But um, whatever questions you have for me, I'd be delighted to entertain them. Any, any decisions that I've made any, uh, in the story, anything you want to talk about about this story in, in particular, or about the process in general, I'd be happy to answer. And be sure and get those questions in in the next, if you're watching this live, on November uh, 16th, 2001. Be sure and get those questions in uh, so I can uh, deal with them. One other thing uh, I want to remind you, if you're watching tonight and you feel that you you want to go back and and catch up or... Um, you feel that um, you want to see things over again, be sure and bookmark this present site. That's www.fsu.edu forward slash uh, tilde butler. That website, um, you need to bookmark it because if you've been getting to it through the Inside Creative Writing icon, on the Florida State University's main homepage, which is simply www.fsu.edu. If you've been going in that way, that icon will be there until November 30th, but then will disappear from the main homepage. You can still find me by going through the, to the, um, the, the um, section of the Florida State University website, not the homepage, but through the website. If you, if you follow the links to the, uh, the page on the Creative Writing Program, you'll find basically forever a link there to these webcast archives. But you might want to go ahead and, and bookmark it if you do expect to return. I think that would be a good idea. So I think it's time now to go to the story. And we're going to, um, I'm going to call it up, and we're going to go to the top of the story. No, I just need not. Let, let's just back up a little ways, uh, just to the part I did last night. Or a little before it. 
I just want to do the back end. I want to give it basically then essentially two two readovers tonight. It is empty. It is empty. Earl Sant's aeroplane was here and now it is gone. I move out to the center. I am surrounded by high pine and there is something. A shapeless patch of burnt earth. I slow and stop before it. He burned here. He vanished from this life here. I take another step. I stand precisely where he fell. For a moment I stretch out my arms as if to fly and they are contained within this black bareness. I hold fast to the steering column and my wings are still whole and I am racing toward those distant pines and a thought occurs to me. I sit on the back of a horse. I am high up above the tree line on a slender thread of a path. Not even the smell of the pines has risen this high. I pause and I look below me. Faces turn up, their hats raised in the air. Tree tops point up to me and I have nothing inside but an enormous quiet. I find myself separated from all that I've known. From every touch, every word, every face, I have lifted up into the air, high on this mountain with nothing around me but the empty sky, high in the air above this meadow. And I think this is how it feels, to be free, to be utterly alone, and my hands clench on the reins. There is only one more thing to feel, to know. My hands clench harder, wanting to slip hard to the right, to leap into that empty sky beneath me. Earl and I. Papa. For a moment I do not recognize the voice. Papa. It is drawn near. I look. It is Matthew. He stands before me. His face is smudged. His hair is tousled. His eyes are fixed hard on mine. I want him to go away from this place quickly. I lift my hand to him, a vague gesture, and I cannot find words. Matty, I say, just that. I am within the circle of Earl's fire and my son is outside. I try to step to him, but I am rooted here. I look up at the trees all around, and then back to my son. His face is turned up to me, waiting. I know too much. I want him to run away from me now. I want him to run away now, not just from this place, but from me. Go on home, I say. His brow furrows very tightly. I step from the circle. I reach out. My hand goes to him, my thumb lands gently on his brow, tries to smooth the furrow away. He backs off. I didn't mean to frighten him. I carry too much in these fingertips now. But suddenly he smiles. Papa, he says, look. His hand comes from behind his back. I don't recognize the object at first, hanging limply over his fingers. It's his, Matthew says, and now I can see. Earl Sant's goggles. I found it, he says, Matthew, as a child and in a time when goggles were not that common an item, would not understand the, their, that, that they are a, one of those odd sort of plural nouns in the English language. So he refers to it as it, and this makes the it, um, Consistent with that, it. One of our, one of our readers uh, asked about that and was suggesting changing its to their his, but but that would be the wrong choice, given uh, that Matthew, as I said, is a child in an era when these are not that familiar objects as objects and. The nicety of there being an, a plural noun would not, um, would not, he would not be in command of that. So, by the way, since this is should be their his instead of it's his, this is a good reminder to all of you that the truth that fiction writers and seek. The precision, the correctness that fiction writers seek is not the superficial, reflex, grammatical, syntactical correctness. It is the deeper emotional and correctness. It's the correctness that is correct for this 
deeply plausible object, art object that we're creating. I struggle once again to draw a breath. The moments I have yearned to share, Earl Sant entered them looking through this thing in my son's hands. But before I can think of what to do, Matthew grasps the goggles at each end and he lifts them high and the strap goes quickly over his head and the goggles slide down and are on his face and I can see his eyes for a moment, his child's eyes, the eyes of my boy, faint there and distant and his face angles and his eyes vanish. The panes of glass go blank from the light and my son lifts his arms. He lifts them like wings and he turns to his left and he begins to run. He runs swooping and lifting and falling. Look, Papa, he cries. Look, I'm Earl Sant. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. I gotta tell you, I'm very happy with that ending. <laughs> and it was, in its essence, un totally unexpected to me. I, that last gesture, the way in which those goggles, I had anticipated by a night or two that the goggles would play a part, but I had no idea how. And I'm, it's one of those times when you just step back from whatever it was that was given you, and it wasn't like it was from yourself at all. Of course, I feel that about all of it in a sense. Okay, let's go over it one more time. I've seen a man die, but not like this. There was silence suddenly around us when he disappeared beyond the trees. Silence after terrible sounds, that hammering of his engine, the engine of his aeroplane, and the other sound after. He had climbed miraculously up, and he had circled the field, and we all took off our hats as one, us men. Mine as well. Hooray, we cried. My son cried out too. Hooray. This was why we'd come to this meadow. We would peek into the future and cheer it on. And Earl Sant hammered overhead and down to the far edge of the pasture, defying the trees, defying the earth. The propeller of his engine spun behind him and he sat in a rattan chair as if he was on his front porch smoking a cigar. Then he came back from the tree line heading our way. I reached down and touched my son on the shoulder. I had never seen an aeroplane and something was changing in me as it approached. I suppose it scared me some. I had no premonition, but I needed to touch my son at that moment, and the plane came toward us, and there was a stiff wind blowing. The plane bucked a little, like a nervous horse, but Earl Sant kept him steady, kept him coming forward, and I felt us all ready to cheer again. Then there was a movement on the wing, with no particular sound, still the engine, but there was a tearing away. If I had been Earl Sant, if I had been sitting in that rattan chair and flying above these bared heads, I might have heard the sound and been afraid. I lifted my camera. This had nothing to do with the thing happening on the wing. I was only vaguely aware of it in that moment. I lifted my camera and I tripped the shutter and here was another amazing thing it seemed to me. One man was flying above the earth and with a tiny movement of a hand another man had captured him. Earl Sant was about to die but he was forever caught there in that box in my hand. I lowered my Kodak and for a moment the plane was before me against the sky and all I felt was a thing that I sometimes had felt as a younger man riding up into the Alleghenies alone and there would be a turning in the path and suddenly the trees broke apart and there was a great falling away of the land. A falling. He fell, Earl said. The aeroplane suddenly lifted up from its left side and for a moment it seemed to flatten itself against the sky. But the engine hammered on and then it skidded to the right and pitched forward and it fell, disappearing behind a stand of pine. By the way, I had a, an interesting email um, from one of you. Uh, let's see if I can see who it was real fast. Um, Well, I can't find it right now, but uh, one of you who's uh, very kindly uh, sent me an email who knew something about airplanes, had actually flown a 1930s biplane, and, uh, and wondered if, uh, from his experience or, or his thoughts about it and some films he had seen, 
uh, had thought that my first impulse of the nose of the plane going straight down uh, may also be correct. Um, uh, and as you know, this was a, a matter of some question for me, and I got some uh, expert advice. Uh, and uh, this is another bit of expert advice, which is uh, provides an alternative. Uh, my feeling about that is once I am within a range even of controversy, uh, and uh, I don't feel uh, of, of the scientific correctness of it, as long as it is plausible for <clears throat> most readers, and as long as there is some science behind it, and there is, um, that at that point you can use the science, as long as it's authenticated to that degree, and you have a choice to make, and you're not, you know, you're not trying to, you don't have to go out and do experiments or find of some third party, if you have two legitimate sources of information uh, saying different things, then use the thing that fits the art the best. And I feel that, that, that this scenario that we now have fits the art of the piece the best. There was a heavy thump beyond the trees, and I have nothing in my head to compare it to. Not a barn collapsing, not a horse going down, not the dead sugar maple, 40 foot high. I had felled only yesterday in our yard. This sound was new, and our silence followed. We all of us could not take this in. He had flown this Earl Sant. He had raised his goggles to his eyes and stepped into his machine, and he had run along the meadow and had lifted into the air, and now I looked into the empty place where he had been, only a moment before. In my head I could see once again the two great wings and the spinning of the propeller and then he was gone. Papa, it was my son's voice drifting up to me from the silence. I looked into his face. It's all right, I said, though I knew it was not. I could feel Matthew's bones beneath my hand, which still lay on his shoulder. He's gone, my son said. I looked to the others. There was a stirring. Mother of God, one man said, and he began to move in the direction of the pines. He was right. We had to do something now. I let go of my son and turned to the place where Earl Sant had vanished. Stay here, I said. We ran, perhaps a dozen of us, across the meadow grass and into the pines, and I could smell burning, and there was smoke up ahead, and I could smell a newly familiar thing, a smell of the automobiles that had come to our town, their fuel. Then we broke into a clearing, and the aeroplane was crumpled up ahead and beginning to burn. I was behind several of the men, and we were in our Sunday clothes. We had left our churches this morning and had come to see the exhibition of this wonderful thing. And now we were stripping off our coats and winding them around our hands and arms to allow us to reach into the flames to bring Earl Sant out. Two men were ahead of me, already bending to the tangle of canvas and wood and metal and smoke. I felt myself slow and stop. I did not know this man. I had seen him only from afar, only briefly. He had raised his goggles and hidden his eyes, and he'd had some intent in his head to fly, of course, and he did. But he was a man, flesh and blood, and he was lying broken now, ahead of me. There were others to help him, the ones ahead, and still others now, rushing past me. I continued to hesitate, and then I turned away. Matthew had followed me. He was standing a few yards behind in the trees. I lifted my hand to acknowledge him, and I found it swathed in my suit coat, expecting the fire. I moved to my son, unwrapping my arm. The others are helping, I said to him, so he would understand why I had turned away. I want to see, he said. No, pa, pa, no, I said, firm. I turned him around, and we stepped out of the trees. I looked once more into the sky where Earl Sant had been. Matthew and I walked from the meadow and through the center of town, passing the Merchant's Bank, where I had an office, where I was vice president, and we moved beneath the maples of our street, old trees, dense above us, and we were quiet, my son and I. The meadow, the open sky, all of that was left behind. Then we reached the place along the road where I could see my house ahead. The maple was gone from the front edge of my property, dead from blight and felled by my own hand. 
I looked away, not wanting to, but I felt suddenly bereft of this tree. I was sorry for its passing, this tree. Matthew broke away from me now, began to run. I looked. His mother was coming down the porch steps. My son ran hard to her, not calling out. She turned her face toward us, saw him approaching, sensing, I think, that something had happened. I stopped, still, still separate from them. My daughter, a tall, gangly girl, my sweet Naomi, emerged from the house, and for a moment they all three were before me, and the house itself, a fine house, a house we'd lived in for four years now, a solid house with its hipped roof and double window dormer and its clabbered siding, the color of sunlight and the brightness of noon. My wife went down on one knee, and Matthew reached her, and he threw his arms around her neck. I knew I should move forward to explain, but what would I say? Naomi came to the two of them, put her hand on her crouching mother's shoulder. There was a seizing in my chest. I wanted to take them all three up into my arms, but instead I stood dumbly there watching. Finally, Rachel's face lifted to look at me over Matthew's shoulder. I felt heavy now, rooted to this earth, as if I decided to take the place of the dead maple. But I made myself move. I took a step and another, and there was a loosening inside me as I moved toward my family. My wife tilted her head slightly, a questioning gesture, I think. Naomi looked at me, too, came around her mother, and I was glad she was drawing near, and she put her arms around me. I felt the bones in her arms pressing at my back. I'm looking at around, around. Those, every art object's organic, as I've said, and I use the repetition of words in an incantory way in this, in this piece, a way that emphasizes the intensification or other kind of shifts in emotion. And so the, the accidental repetitions, close repetitions of words then you need to be careful about it. and that's why I'm doing taking that one out. My wife tilted her head slightly, a questioning gesture, I think. Naomi looked at me too, came around her mother, and I was glad she was drawing near, and she put her arms about me. I felt the bones in her arms pressing at my back. I held her tight. What was it, Daddy? An accident, I said. It was just an accident. Maddie said he was dead, the man. We don't know that for sure. He fell? Yes. She said no more, but she needed me to hold her closer, and I did. It's all right, I said. We're all right. Matthew could not sleep. The house was dark, and my wife and I had just extinguished the lamp, alone and undistracted at last. Then we heard his cry, wordless, and Rachel rose. I knew what it was about. As she disappeared, I looked toward the dark gape of the bedroom door, and I gripped the sheet as if to put it aside and to rise. But I hesitated. I should not have hesitated to go to my son, but I did, for one moment and then another. I forced myself to throw back the sheet and put my feet on the floor. I stood. I made my way across the room and down the hall, and my son's tears were fading as I approached. I stood in his doorway, and his mother said to him, It's okay, Manny. God decided he wanted an aeroplane pilot in heaven. Like he wanted Henry for an angel, my son said. I turned away. I moved back down the hall and then stopped, neither here nor there. Matthew's first cousin, Henry, my brother's son, had died of smallpox. My son had already encountered death. Of course he had. We had all encountered death. It was a part of our daily lives. Always we waited for the first sneeze, the first cough, the first spot on our skin. We waited to be carried away, if not from smallpox, then from influenza, or from scarlet fever, or from diphtheria, or from pneumonia, or from tuberculosis. It was the way of the world. I believed in God, that he managed our lives, that he would call us when he chose to. 
and I was glad my son could picture his blood kin, a child of his own age, as an angel and not as a corpse in the ground. By the way, um, I know you're looking at me f probably from this direction. Just to remind you, it's all part of process. If you, s I have a, a a kind of what surge, permanent surge of energy during the creative process, even the process of revising, as you know for me, is a matter of redreaming. So if you see me kind of bouncing a little, I tend to bounce my leg as a kind of just something to do with all the, the energy that is, is, is waiting to be focused in here. I don't bounce at what I'm writing, you'll notice. I stop then, but in between, it's like, um, you know, the, the kind of between, between pitch rituals of a, of a baseball pitcher. It's that energy that is about to be focused. And then in between times, it's, it's like the engine idling. And uh, so I do a, a good of the, a deal of that. So please um, understand that. that. Again, all of these things are part of process. I'm trying to share everything with you. But I stood in the middle of the hallway and I dragged my forearm across my brow and I was having trouble drawing a breath. I waited in bed, sitting propped up in the dark, sweating still. Finally, Rachel appeared in the door, quietly, pausing there in the dim light, her white nightgown glowing faintly as if she were a ghost. I spoke to her at once to drive that image from my mind. Is he all right? I don't know, she said, and she floated this way. Rachel, I said, yes. She was beside the bed now. I had spoken her name without anything more to say. I just needed to say her name. Nothing, I said. What happened out there? The plane crashed, I said. These machines aren't safe. Rachel drew back the sheet and sat beside me. Paul, I looked toward her. Her face was there, turned to me, featureless in the dark. She touched my hand and repeated, almost in a whisper, what happened? I don't know. I was Earl Sant. Does that sound familiar? I'll let you know the end of the story. Just that I went, da-da, hello. <laughs> Something I hadn't thought about before. I was Earl Sant. Sitting in my rattan chair, I looked down and the faces all turned upward and the mouths all opened to cry out, but the only sound I could hear was the rush of air about me as I flew. I flew and the lift was not in my wings, it was in my chest, my very chest. I was buoyed up and moving quickly. And there was nothing around me now, not the aeroplane, not the rattan chair, only the wide, bright air. I looked down again, and there was only one face below, and it was my own. Mine. I woke up. I woke. I sat up quickly, expecting to rise from the bed and up through the ceiling and out into the night sky. But I was awake. I was sitting on my bed. That up, up works fine, by the way. I noticed it. But I was awake. I was sitting on my bed. Nevertheless, I lifted my eyes and I saw the aeroplane, its broad wings, their fragile bones holding them in place, the bones stretching behind to the smaller back wings, the tail. And then suddenly the beast veered and showed me its dark underside and it dashed down. And then the sound. I jumped up from the bed, knocking into the bedstand. What is it? Rachel cried. I'm all right, I said. Was it Maddie? It was a dream, I said. I do not require silence at the breakfast table. We eat together each day, my wife and my son and my daughter and I. Even when my children have one leg skewed off from under the table, ready to run into the summer morning. They have their duties in this house, but the mornings are theirs. It is best to let a child feel his freedom in the morning. And they are free to speak as well. I like to listen to the movement of my children's minds. But this morning there was silence, a long period of silence and their legs were under the table, in spite of it being early summer. And without urging, Matthew was eating his eggs, studiously sopping up the last bits of yolk with a piece of bread. I had not picked up the newspaper that lay folded beside my plate. I could see, in large, bold type, in the upturned quarter, the words, Aviator Killed. It was not uncommon for me to read the newspaper at the breakfast table, but only after we'd all had a chance to speak of the day to come. I looked at Rachel. 
She was lifting her coffee cup. <coughs> Pardon me. She was lifting her coffee cup to her lips, and I could see that her eyes were on Matthew. He was intent on the bread, running it around and around the plate. Naomi was looking out the kitchen door. I followed her gaze. The sun was bright. The trees quaked. A scrap of paper blew across the yard, lifting briefly into the air, and then it fell and tumbled along. I placed my hand on the newspaper, but I did not open it. I looked at my hand. It covered the words in the headline. Finally, I said, it looks like a fine day. Matthew lifted his face at this. May I be excused, he said. Yes. He pushed back his chair and he rose, and only now was I hearing the flatness of his voice. He was a boy. This was the moment of the day to be relished above all our others. Maddie, my wife, said, are you all right? My son had moved toward the door. He stopped now and, he, and turned to us. His two shoulders lifted slightly and fell. It was a very small gesture, really, this shrug, but it made my eyes close so as not to see it, this gesture in my son that was not the gesture of a child at all. Too late. I opened my eyes. He was pushing through the screen door, not having spoken a word. Now we know where he was going, don't we? A Monday morning in the year of our Lord, 1913, a desk in a bank, a newspaper tucked under my arm and then put away in a drawer. I sat and my hands were flat and unmoving on the top of my desk, my mahogany desk, and above me was a high window and I have always liked the column of sky looking over me and I have liked the hush of the bank. It is not blasphemy to say that the hush was like that of a church. We protected the money of the people of this town and their money was a measure of their hard work and their hard work rightly gave them the things of this world, the things of a world changing rapidly now. The hush of the bank, and there were low voices murmuring, and I knew their words. I could hear terrible, and I could hear aeroplane, and I could hear fire, and I could hear dead. I wanted to stand up and cry out to my tellers and my customers, go about your business, all of you, just go about your business. But I did not stand. I swiveled in my chair and raised my eyes to the window to the empty morning sky. I had myself gone up into that sky, higher even than Earl Sant. I had stood in the air. I had stood and looked out on a great city, on a world of business and banking, a world of making goods and buying and selling and building houses and factories, and I looked out on steamships and trains and bridges and, far off, a vast sea. I was standing within a thing as great as all of that, the Singer Building, the highest building in the world at that moment in the summer of 1909, when my host, a fellow banker, lifted his office window on the 38th floor, and I trembled like a horse before a fire. By the way, here's a fo footnote particularly for Donna and for any of you others who are wondering about this. Um, Paul is not speaking when he says that the Singer building was the highest building in the world at that moment. He's not speaking from some period way down the line. Uh, in fact, the Singer building was the highest building in the world for only a little over a year. By, oh, the end of 1910, uh, the Metropolitan Life building um, was the tallest building in the world. And then that changed um, soon after that. Uh, I don't remember what was next, but they kept escalating until uh, the 30s when, uh, well, the Chrysler Building became the tallest building in the world briefly, and then the Empire State Building superseded that. But uh, by 1913, when uh, Earl, I mean, when Paul is, uh, sees um, Earl Sant die, by 1913, uh, uh, the Singer building is no longer the tallest building in the world. So, I crept forward and I felt my chest swell. I grew large with fear and happiness to look at this city, vast and multiform in its stone and marble and terracotta, the work of human hands. I stepped closer still. I grew bold. 
the air moved on my face, an air only the clouds knew. But I was part of a race of creatures of the earth who were remaking themselves into something new. I took the last step a man could take and not fall. I pressed against the sill and I bent forward at the waist and looked across the rooftops below, the rooftops that themselves were higher than any tree on earth, but far below me now. And I looked beyond the docks and masts and smokestacks. I followed the bright thread of the Hudson River to Ellis Island and the statue of Madame Liberty, her arm lifted high. Earl Sant, I lift my arm to you. I stand in the meadow beside my son, a blazing torch in my hand. Come here to me, guide your plane this way, fly down to this flame, and land safely beside me. I look from where I sit in the rattan chair, my hands on the steering handle. I see the flame below, and my wing is not yet torn. I nudge my aeroplane gently downward, down toward the man and the boy. I will be safe. But I am not Earl Sand. He is dead. I have seen men die before. My father long ago, his lungs bricked up solid with pneumonia, a man in the Alleghenies broken beneath a felled tree when I was young and working in timber, and another in New York City on that day in 1909, when I went out of the Singer building and into the streets that were dim even near noon, streets narrow and full of rushing men and the hammering of metal and the whine of wheels and the mutter of automobile engines and the clatter of a distant elevated train, and I turned to look up at the place where I'd stood, in the middle of the air, and my eyes went up and up, impossibly high, up the great blue stone and red brick column, up to its great mansard roof and cupola, and the bright sky beyond. Step lively, a voice said, and I looked, and I could not pick the speaker out of a hundred bowlered men moving all about me. I stepped away up the street which was cloaked in the shadows of skyscrapers as far as I could see. I moved, and suddenly before me there was a gathering of men, and some bowlers were coming off, and I came up. He was in a greatcoat in spite of the heat. He was sprawled face down, his arms outstretched, his legs spread wide. The men about him were quiet. I thought to look up. A gray stone building loomed over us, perhaps 200 feet high. I looked back down to the dead man. A policeman pushed past me and bent to the body. I found myself standing beside my desk in the bank on the morning after Earl Sant died. I could not recall the act of rising from this chair. I reached out my hand, stiffened my fingertips on the corner of my desk, held myself up. I had to go out, I realized. Okay, I'm looking at out, out now. You see them? I reached out my hand, stiffened my fingertips in the corner of my desk, held myself up. I had to go out, I realized. Gosh, I, I like that a little better. Even anyway, there's an extra beat of this very deliberate movement. Uh, sometimes struggling just with a little technical problems leads you actually to uh, improve the piece in some even small way, which is always which is not. And there's no small way actually in a work of art, and so uh, leads you even to find a way to improve the piece in 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 some deeper way. I found myself standing beside my desk in the bank in the morning after Earl Sant died. I could not recall the act of rising from this chair. I extended my arm, touched my hand at the corner of my desk, stiffened my fingertips, held myself up. I had to go out, I realized. I moved to the coat rack and took my hat and I put it on my head and I stepped from my office and my secretary looked up and I said to her, I'll be back shortly. 
She lifted her eyebrows ever so slightly. This was unlike me, of course, but I did not pause to explain. There was no explanation. I stepped into the sunlight before the bank and turned toward the woods where he had gone down. A wagon was moving toward me from the tree line as I approached. I stopped. The horse had its head down as if the load were heavy. But the wagon... Down, 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 gone down, head down, head lowered. A wagon was moving toward me from the tree line as I approached. I stopped. The horse had its head lowered as if the load was heavy, but the wagon moved easily, quickly. I stepped away from it. The driver turned his face to me, a man I knew, a collector of scrap goods. He nodded, but I could not return the nod. I was leaden now in my limbs. The wagon slipped past and I glanced into the bed of it. Twisted metal, charred wood, a panel of canvas. I looked sharply to the side. This whole thing was a mistake to come here again. I thought to back away, to face toward the town, the square, the bank, the maple trees, face toward my house where I would surely live the rest of my life. I could not. I had to press on into the stand of pine, but I had to catch my breath first. I felt as if I'd been running a long way. I bent forward and put my hands on my knees. Above me was the sky where Earl Sant had spent his last moments of life. I did not look. I leaned hard onto my knees. I closed my eyes. I held tight to the steering handle and there was something terribly wrong. These wings that felt like my own limbs. I sensed them stretching out from me and lifting me up. These wings went weak and so did my limbs of flesh. I was instantly aware of the very surface of my skin, the beating of my heart. You don't have to say I was afraid, right? And I felt a question rise like a gasp into my throat. What was it I believed? Did I sense a God all about me in the sky? Was it he who lifted me and would take me now into his arms? Forgive me, no. This thing I had expected to be familiar, my own death, was all new. I fell. I fell from him. His hands receded and the trees reached up and I fell. I could not breathe at all. I rose up from where I'd been bending and I stood straight and dragged the air into my lungs and I opened my eyes and before me was the tree line, the pines, and beyond them was the clearing where he fell and burned Earl Sant. And he knew something now, right this moment, something that I desperately wished to know. He had been alive above me in the sunlit air just yesterday, and now he knew the great truth of it all. I stepped forward, moved toward the trees. My breath had returned, fragile, easily taken away. But I breathed deep once and again, and I walked into the darkness of the trees, and I was filled with the smell of pine all about me, and the smell of the duff beneath my feet, and with other smells, not of the forest, faintly still of smoke in the air and the fuel of the aeroplane. I pressed on, my face lowered, feeling the trees on the back of my neck, in my shoulders, in a faint wrenching upward in my chest. I've been around trees often in my life. I made a life from the forest before I became who I am, a man with a desk in a bank and a Georgian revival home and a wife and a son and a daughter and a special pew in a church where the deacons sit. And I know nothing about anything. I know only that I must press past these last few trees and into this clearing, which I do. It is empty. It is empty. Earl Sant's aeroplane was here and now it is gone. I move out to the center. I am surrounded by high pine and there is something, a shapeless patch of burnt earth. I slow and stop before it. He burned here. He vanished from this life here. I take another step. I stand precisely where he fell. For a moment I stretch out my arms as if to fly, and they are contained within this black bareness. I hold fast to the steering column and my wings are still whole and I am racing toward those distant pines and a thought occurs to me. I sit on the back of a horse. I am high up, above the tree line, on a slender thread of a path. Not even the smell of the pines has risen this high. I pause and I look below me. Faces turn up, their hats raised high in the air. Treetops point up to me and I have nothing inside but an enormous quiet.
I find myself separated from all that I've known, from every touch, every word, every face. I have lifted up into the air, high on this mountain, with nothing around me but the empty sky, high in the air above this meadow. And I think this is how it feels. To be free, to be utterly alone, and my hands clench on the reins. There is only one more thing to feel, to know. My hands clench harder, wanting to slip hard to the right, to leap into that empty sky beneath me, Earl and I. Papa, for a moment I did not recognize the voice. Papa, it is drawn near. I look, it is Matthew. He stands before me. His face is smudged, his hair is tousled, his eyes are fixed hard on mine. I want him to go away from this place quickly. I lift my hand to him, a vague gesture, and I cannot find words. Matty, I say just that. I am within the circle of Earl's fire, and my son is outside. I try to step to him, but I am rooted here. I look up at the trees all around, and then back to my son. His face is turned up to me, waiting. I know too much. I want him to run away now, not just from this place, but from me. Go on home, I say. His brow furrows very slightly. I step from the circle. I reach out. My hand goes to him. My thumb lands gently on his brow, tries to smooth the furrow away. He backs off. I didn't mean to frighten him. I carry too much in these fingertips now. But suddenly he smiles. Papa, he says, look. His hand comes from behind his back. I don't recognize the object at first, hanging limply over his fingers. It's his, Matthew says, and now I can see. Earl Sant's goggles. I found it, he says. I struggle once again to draw a breath. The moments I have yearned to share, Earl Sant entered them looking through this thing in my son's hand. Before I can think what to do, Matthew grasps the goggles at each end, and he lifts them, and the strap goes quickly over his head and the goggles slide down and are on his face and I can see his eyes for a moment, his child's eyes, the eyes of my boy, faint there and distant and his face angles and his eyes vanish. The panes of glass go blank from the light and my son lifts his arms. He lifts them like wings and he turns to his left and he begins to run. He runs swooping and lifting and falling. Look, Papa, he cries. Look. I'm Earl Sand. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to let it cool off for <clears throat> not quite 48 hours. And I'm going to read it again uh, in printed text form. And uh, whatever I find then, and I, I don't expect it to be much, and whatever I do find, I will bring in, fix that first thing on Sunday evening. And then I will read the story to you for the first time ever as a finished story. I'm feeling pretty good. All right. Let's, uh, we've got, gee, we got an hour for questions now. This is great. We can make some progress on all these wonderful questions you've been sending. So, put my feet up. Jane, from right here in Tallahassee. I uh, had a couple of her questions last night. I want to finish this up. She says, how far into a story are you usually before you know how it is going to end? Well, uh, Jane, is, uh, there are two answers to that question. <clears throat> usually, usually in a, in a kind of general sense of where the venue of the ending will be, I'll know that in a short story, 
probably several days before I get there. But in a, in a more precise and full way, I think this story is very typical. I knew about, what was it? I don't know. You have to look at these webcasts again. Two or three nights before, I knew, I sensed, I thought. No, I didn't think. I had the intuition that the, um, the goggles that Matthew, I had, I had the intuition real early when I did my first dream storming, or I think. Anyway, a lot earlier, I knew that the ending would have to involve Matthew. A little farther along, I knew that it would involve Matthew out somewhere on that Earl Sands site. And then just a couple of nights ago, I knew that the goggles would be involved, but it was only when I was here writing those words last night that Matthew surprised me and put the, goggle, the goggles on and lifted his arms and, and began in that very complex gesture, I think, of, try, of, of pretending he was Earl Sant. So, in that sense, I think this, this, this story is very typical, that uh, the, the full, that full kind of epith, often epiphany at the end is, is hidden from me until it actually happens. Okay. Um, I have a strong suspicion that Andrew Cohen is about to enter, and so he is. Thank you, sir. Andrew Cohen, my uh, fine uh, graduate student writing a wonderful novel right now, and has brought me your questions. All right. Uh, these I'll save for Sunday night. Uh, Avis Hester in Georgia asked, has anything just completely shut down your writing? If so, how have you dealt with it? Um, sometimes inevitable, inescapable external circumstances will shut my writing down. Back when I was um, but, um, working in New York, writing my books on my lap on the Long Island Railroad, uh, and I had published four novels. My fourth had come out from Alfred A. Knopf. You might say I got my PhD at the University of Knopf because on the strength of all that publishing, I got my first creative writing teaching job at McNeese State University in Lake Charles, Louisiana, which is, by the way, a fine, a fine university, and um, they have a good program there as well. But McNeese um, hired me, and I was in the middle of writing a novel that eventually was published by Knopf and called Wabash. And Wabash. Um, was a um, was a book that I had used that dream that dream storming method on that I've taught you some nights back. So it was a novel that I had done a, a great deal of of pre dreaming for. Had my cards, my three by five cards of possible scenes. Had worked my way halfway through the novel. But because I physically moved from New York City, or the New York City area, to southwestern Louisiana, just, and you know, I'm, I'm sh anybody who's moved, especially across country, knows what a wrenching and absorbing experience that is. And I moved into a house that needed some work. Not that I did it myself, but the house was torn up and the packing and the unpacking and all of that. I put the novel aside for the move. I moved in June of 1985. And in September of 1985, I returned to that novel. 
that novel, I knew those characters better than I knew my blood kin, practically. Maybe, in fact. Um, I had a strong sense of where that novel was heading, but I had let June, July, August, three months lapse where my writing shut down for three months. And I tell you, Avis, it took me eight or ten weeks to get back to write another word on that novel, going every day to my writing room, and it was horrible. It was terrible. As I've said, this dream space is a, is a demanding place, and man, if you don't keep that connection going, it, the connection to it seals up tight, erases all trace of itself. It's like you never wrote a word in your life before. How to deal with it is just keep on dreaming. You go in there every day. You, 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 you refuse to let yourself stay in your rational mind. I used, eventually I started doing it, doing this thing I mentioned, I think, in an earlier broadcast, webcast. I think I've mentioned everything I've ever known in the, some webcast or other in this, along the way here. Um, but um, I, I, I started writing first thing. I, I rise from sleep at night and move straight to the, to the computer and, st and, um, and start writing. No, not computer. I was still writing by hand at that time. Uh, but I went straight to my office with my legal pads and I, I would cont I'd start writing. Eventually that worked and eventually I got back in it. As your writer, what is your greatest fear? Wow. I guess the greatest fear is always that um, that somehow someday you just can't get into the place where you have to go. I mean, as a writer, I um, I have to go into an incredibly daunting, frightening, demanding place in myself every day. And the greatest fear is that you can't, that someday you go there, you, you turn your computer off or whatever, and, you, and the next day you go and you can't get back, and you never get back again. I mean, if there is a fear, that's the fear. I got to tell you, it's not a very big fear, honestly. Because the other thing you have to do is you have to have what? Let's say faith, huh? You're asking the big questions. You believe that there is order to the universe and more likely some sentience behind the universe, and you just you open yourself to that and you have faith that it's going to be there. And so that fear, I, though it would be my greatest fear if I had to pick one, it's not a really big fear. Now, it's interesting to note, and your next question is, as a beginning writer, what was your greatest fear? And this is, becomes a very interesting question then, Avis, because as a beginning writer, my biggest fear was that I would never get published. It's the wrong thing to fear. It's the wrong thing to concentrate on. It's like, if you want to use a religious analogy, it's like the pagan, it's like the golden calf. If, you're, if, you're, if your ambitions for yourself, if your ambition is to get published, to be famous, to, to, to create these things that, that everybody's going to love and they're going to love you because of it, if that's your ambition, I got to tell you, that's a big, that, that could be an enormous stumbling block to getting to the place you have to go. It was for me, I think. I didn't really start writing well. I did not start publishing until I let it go. You have to let it go. That kind of stuff 
You have to let it go. You cannot have your, your ambition to be famous. You cannot have your ambition to be, you know, even necessarily to be published. It's something you want, fine. It's something you try for, fine. But your ambition has to be to create objects in which you explore and articulate your deepest sense of the world, your deepest sense of the universe. And that's got to be it. That's got to be enough. That's everything. And look, even after you start publishing, even after you are famous, it never stops the problems, you know. Then you've got book reviewers who don't understand your work, even despise your work. I mean, I've had... You know, I'm sure that story I've just written, there are going to be people who will read it and hate it. Just don't get it. They just don't, you know, Robert Olin Butler, eh, I just don't, he's, I don't get it, you know. I'm not a big fan of his, or worse. I, he's, he's really an overrated writer or a bad writer or whatever. He, you know, once you get to be, you know, have some no, public... Attention drawn to you, get published. It, it, the problems never stop, and if, and you will drive yourself crazy, and you, and then you will lose your ability to get into your unconscious if you let all that stuff matter to you. Ultimately, you have to let all of that go. You just let it go. The work is the thing. The work is the thing. The work, that, that communion you have with, you, with your deepest unconscious, where eventually you'll break through and find that you're, near, you're neither American or Vietnamese or, or Russian or Afghan. You're not black or white or yellow. You're not male or female. You are human. You are connected to the deepest, deepest place in, in your unconscious. The, the closer you get to who you are as an individual, the closer you get to your connection with everybody. And you, you can't do that worrying about the reviews or the, you know, your publisher or getting published or being famous or any of that. You let that stuff go. Just let it go. So when I was a beginning writer and writing badly, one of the reasons I was writing badly is that what I was really focused on was getting published and being famous. And you know what? You can understand, I think, how those ambitions are apt to draw you up into your mind where you start trying to anticipate the publishers and anticipate the editors and figure out how to how to manage your career and how to make the shrewd move and write the shrewd story and so forth and it all gets willed and it all gets from the head and you're lost Linda Carlson in Los Angeles says um, I have watched all the sessions up through November 15th you seem to be more and more exhausted. Yes, you're right, Linda. I know you have been ill, but it occurs to me that you may also be taxed by the rigor of so many visits to your dream space. Can you comment? Yeah, you know, and I've mentioned that I've been struggling, you can even hear it tonight, struggling with a kind of head cold uh, for some time here, which does not keep me from going to the writing room here. And even if I didn't have the responsibility to you <clears throat> every night, I would certainly, in the privacy of my own writing space, I would have been writing every night here too. But actually, it's, it's not been a terrible cold. I've been on top of it, more or less, and it never did get to a stage where uh, it was wearing me down or exhausting me. The exhaustion that you are picking up in me, Linda, 
and rightly is indeed the exhaustion that you're identify here. It is, it is exhausting to go into that place I was just describing. That's why that's why so many writers, you read about Ernest Hemingway, for example, he wrote two hours a day. You think, gee, this is, this is a job to have, you know? You only work two hours a day. Uh, folks, the two hours you spend, if you spend two hours in your dream space, it's going to take it out of you, I, I promise you. That is an enormously difficult thing, enormously taxing, enormously stressful, enormously difficult. And I'm mentioning the hard stuff because I, I don't want you to get spooked by it and, it's, and you're going to have to exert your courage. But also it's enormously exhilarating and it's enormously exciting. And it can be enormously, and it's enormously pleasurable and it's enormous fun at times. And, and light things come out of that dream space as well as the dark things. But it's the dark things that's going to make you flinch. Go back to that great Akira Kurosawa quote that I quoted early on, to be an artist means never to avert your eyes. And it's the averting of the eyes that, 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 that destroys the work. And it's the dark stuff that make you avert the eyes, not, not the stuff that's light. But it's, so it's, it, there, there are wonderful things about it too. But yeah, it's exhausting. It is. You just have to understand that and you do it. You know, um, it's exhausting. Anything that's done well and with high levels of concentration is exhausting. Athletes get exhausted. You know, I'm sure Mick Jagger is pretty exhausted on his, on his rock and roll tours these days. I mean, anything you do well, it's creative, that's concentrate it's going to be exhausting. Linda also asked do you experience any sense of sadness or grief when you complete a story and leave those people behind and or have to move out of a daily visit to the dream space? Yes. These are good questions Linda. You, you're absolutely right. There's a kind of postpartum depression that you go through. Um, it is uh, you know and again you know how artists hate abstractions and well, do we have to talk about them sadness grief depression whatever yeah it's a complex thing in akin to some of that the stuff that you might pull into your mind with those words and that's part of the process it's, part, it's very natural it's a good thing in a sense I mean it reflects a good thing you've been in a, an important place you've birthed something that's part of you and now no longer is within you it is also outside of you and you have to give it to the world then you know though you don't worry about publishing we just talked about that but although you try to but yeah it's it's tough and the daily d visit to the dream space is a, is a is an important thing a wonderful thing a demanding thing but you do love it you get used to it and in between projects you're going to have problems. I'm going to try to get back to writing another short story as soon as I possibly can. It won't be immediately. I've got to recalibrate. You know, I've got to redream and, and, and wake up from this dream thoroughly and, and then go back into another dream. And I will. And I'll do it as quickly as I can. But there will be some time in between. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's a demanding and... Uh, and uh, sometimes distressing time. Adele in uh, Mississippi asks, she says, during the online session, I watched you choose precise words with which to tell your Earl Sant story. Number one, how difficult is it then for you to come to the end of your story and turn it over to an editor who may suggest that you change some of those precise words? And do you ever feel that you are compromising your story if you agree to an editor's changes? Well, uh, the difficulty coming to the end of the story I've just, just talked about in answer to the previous question. Turning it over to the editor, uh, who may indeed make some suggestions about some of those precise words, 
the objects that we create <clears throat> are extremely complex. Well, you can imagine. You've seen. You've seen the process. They're very complex objects. There's an enormous, every, every tiny thing has a profound resonant implication within the work. And all of those resonances have to be harmonized and, and synchronized and put together and made everything whole. It's humanly impossible to catch everything most of the time. And so it's good to have the editor. You know, you've got, it's good to have a good editor who really gets inside your work and can talk to you from within. So, uh, the, you know, if you have a good editor, and uh, then then it's a very useful process and a necessary one. There is no literary artist in the face of the earth who doesn't need an outside ear to help clarify. These outside ears, however, if they treat you with the kind of respect they should, they're going to make, they're going to just give you their response. And most of them won't even offer you, a good editor, editor probably won't even offer you a concrete alternative. And if they do, it's done with great respect and tentative, humble uh, demeanor, and they mean it. Ultimately, everyone I work with has to let the final decision on artistic matters reside with me. So I'll hear their suggestions, and if I think it's a good suggestion, I'll deal with it, respond to it, and be grateful for it. If it's not, I don't do it. So, no, I don't compromise my story because if I don't agree with the editor's suggestion, the editors I work with, uh, and most editors are, like, are this way, will accede to the, the writer's uh, judgment. Okay, Brian Kelly in San Diego says, As a beginning fiction writer, I've enjoyed watching these webcasts very much. Do you think the teaching of creative writing online, complete with interactive student readings, will be offered elsewhere now that you've broken the ice? Have you thought about offering such a course on a regular basis? Well, the way you described the course here, Brian, uh, I think, is inevitably coming uh, and could well be common someday. Teaching creative writing online complete with interactive student readings. Interactive, I assume by that you mean where the teacher and the student can talk about and critique and so forth through the internet. Uh, the ice that I have broken here, however, is a rather rarer kind of ice than that. If you mean the traditional workshop formats in which it's done on the internet instead of in a classroom, absolutely, that's, that's got to be coming soon. Um, we're, here at Florida State University, we've not gotten to the point where, we're, where we are seriously thinking about that, but uh, the internet is the future, folks. I mean, there's, I don't see any question in that. In terms of other writers, teaching by the method that I've been teaching, that is where the, the artist creates something, every, in every tiny detail, every comma stroke, in real time on the web. I don't know how common that can be, will become. I, not very, I suspect. I've, I've got to be honest, my writer friends all think I'm a little nuts for having done this, um, and which suggests to me that they're certainly not planning to uh, pick up uh, where I leave off here. I may do it again. Uh, 
it's possible that I will do it again. Um, based on popular demand, I guess. But um, I don't think that's going to be very common. And, it, and, it, and, I, and if I do it again, I'm not sure. I, I don't think it would reach the, uh, the level of an official uh, sanctioned for credit course. What's well, a good good idea, Brian? And, and the other th the other thing, though, I think definitely is coming. Okay, here's a question from uh, Rob Lee Light, who's uh, actually in our biochemistry department here at Florida State University. He's been watching, and he says, "As I watch you type and revise, I can't help wondering how this price process might be different for you." Uh, than that in the old days when story drafts were written in pencil or pen on a yellow legal pad. He knows that I do that. Or even not quite so old days when typewriters and whiteout were the tools of typing and revision. Does the ease of deleting, cutting, and past pasting, etc., with the computer mean less distractions as you are crafting a sentence or paragraph, or does the technology detract from your dream state? Okay. And he's got some sub questions here. Let's take them one at a time. How is it different from when I was writing with legal pads or with typewriter? Now, I never wrote with a typewriter. Because, as you've noticed if you've been watching me, I, um, I like to revise as I go. I do not make approximations of sentences or anything. As I write, I try to get the thing I've just written to be as full and whole and organically complete as I can at that moment. Now, it's subject to later revision, of course. But because I write like that, I never did use a typewriter because you can imagine how typing it really gets in the way of that kind of circle back, circle back, revise, revise, revise. So the way I used the typewriter before computers, I would write by hand where you can erase, scratch out, go into the margins, scratch a whole bunch out, redo it, and so forth easily. I'd do that those five days a week while I was on the Long Island Railroad, and then on Saturdays, I would type what I had written during the week and then work over the text there and actually make a little, do a little revisions as I type. But, but, the, but the putting out of the sentences and the work them over, I did uh, on hand. For me, the computer is fabulous at that. And then in terms of your second question, no, it doesn't drop me out of the dream state at all. In fact, I think it facilitates it because now the images and so forth, the words that are gathering inside me can come out in more in real time than they used to. Everything was kind of like walking under water before, s slowing down to the, to the pace of physical handwriting. That faster pace of the computer is, uh, is, a, is a great help. I'm sorry, I'm going to need to take a little water here. Still with this little cold I've been fighting. Okay. If you wanted, and it goes on, Rob Lee does, Rob Lee does, um, if you wanted to take a vacation to the beach and write a story there, would you be lost without your laptop or comfortable with pen and paper? I think I'd be relatively comfortable with pen and paper again. But the laptops are so, I mean, I wouldn't literally write on the beach. I'd go back, sit on the veranda, and write there, and I could write on my lap. I can write anywhere with a, with a laptop. I write on, you know, you may suddenly someday sit beside me on an airplane flying somewhere. I'll be there. Often, if I'm in the midst of something, I'll be writing on, a, on the tray table on an airplane. I'll write in hotel rooms or... Uh, I, I wrote on the on the the balcony of a hotel in in Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon. Uh, in, in a trip back there just recently, so I'll I'll write anywhere and and the but the computer the portables are so wonderful that 
I, I don't feel compelled to go back to pencil and, or pen and paper, though I think I could. And he says, oh yes, I notice you have turned off the spell check and grammar check of your word processor. Right. Do you recommend that students use them or not use them? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, yes, they are turned off. Um, the grammar check, absolutely. I mean, if I were to run the grammar check on this story, it would be quite amusing all the things that the grammar check, which is that horrible kind of reflex template of grammar and syntax and punctuation that you lay over a story and without any sense of what what the English language is about because syntax, grammar, and punctuation are there not as a, as a kind of end in itself. These, these are not ends in themselves. They are handmaidens to communication. And the communication and work of art is of a different sort from the communication of a business letter or whatever. So, no, don't ever use the grammar checker. The, 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 the spell checker I will use, um, and I'll, I'll probably run it um, at some point on this story. I don't keep it turned on because I'm sure you've noticed I'm a kind of a wild, I'm a touch typist, but I make a lot of, you know, just finger mistakes. And so I, uh, even if I make a spelling mistake or a typographical mistake, I want to go, and, I, and though I work the sentences over, I'd rather do it in my own time, and I don't want the those little, whatever, flags they, they put up, the underlining or the color or whatever. I just don't want to know when I've made a typo. In, on the fly. So, Rob Lee, those are the answer to those questions. I'm glad you asked that. I think those are probably things that should be on people's minds. Andrew, my, uh, my uh, grad student who brought these questions in, has uh, put one of his questions in here. He says, regarding the giving birth to the story analogy, what if you knew there are, what if you know there are only eight or nine toes when you're done, but you can't tell which toes are missing? <laughs> This is the analogy I used last night. Also, what if there are 11 toes? How do you tell which toe to amputate? Well, uh, I, I, don't want to I don't want to push this metaphor too far, Andrew. Um, the sense that, however, uh, that there, there is in this, in this object that you've created The 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 uh, I prefer to to go back to the thrum twang thing, which I've also done. That you read the story and you go thrum thrum. You know that's the way. You don't understand a work of art. This is for those of you who haven't heard me say this, which I've done several times. You don't understand a work of art when you read it. That's not the point. You're not meant as an aesthetic experience, as your primary way of relating to a work of art, you encounter, encounter it as experience. You do not encounter it as a kind of elaborate word game intended for you to extract from it, you know, abstract themes and philosophy and theory and so forth. No, it's a, it's a sensual encountering. It's a dream space to dream space encountering. And, uh, As I put it, you're meant to thrum to a work of art, thrum, you know, a resonance, a harmonic. And instead of, and the eight or nine toes comes out in the fact that you go thrum, 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 and you're up to about nine toes, and then you go twang with the absence of that toe, or you go thrum to the tenth toe, and then twang, there's an excess toe here. Where, you know, you will know. Where the missing to where the missing toes should have been, and you will know from that where there's toes that shouldn't be, and then it's just a matter of redreaming, reconceiving that part of the child. You have to go back and redream. Revising is redreaming, and then you redream that part, and the and the the new toes or where the toes should be going out, 
those things come to you in the same way that the toes that are there that are appropriate came to you, and that is from the dream space, okay? Good question. Felicia White in Tulsa, Oklahoma says, was your dream state influenced by the music as you wrote and to what extent? Ah, oh, there are follow-up questions. Let me get them out. Do you think the story would have taken another turn with different music? Would What path would the story have taken if composed without music? Do you ever write in silence? What benefit do you feel music provides the writing environment? Well, for me, the music... And I, I take pains to, to choose music that has the right emotional valence for me. Though that... that so the right, the right, but it's a kind of general putting in the trance. It's not. It's the. It's the mantra, as it were. Um, it does not provide the content, and it does not. I do not expect it to follow the emotional nuances either. To that extent, I can blot it out. So um, I don't think that the music itself has, has influenced what came out of my dream space. It has provided a kind of mantra. It has been kind of, kind of, of sensual setting in which I, would, I write. It could, for others, it might be a, a waterfall or or silence, and I and, it's, and I have written in silence in the past. Yes, uh, all, and I've written in 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 situations that were not silent, and and the and the ambient sound was was, if anything, an impedance. As I said, well, not only did I write on my lap on legal pads because I was writing on the Long Island Railroad because. Laptop computers weren't around yet, but neither. I was also writing on there before the Walkman came along, and I, I think I owned one of the first Walkman, and uh, it was a, a wonderful thing for me. But no, I wrote in silence, in, not in silence. I wrote without music, and with the flapping of papers and conversations and and bridge bidders killing each other over the wrong bid and. The conductor going up and down and asking things and the train sounds and all of that was going on. And I wrote some novels I'm proud of in that, in that setting. So ultimately, you can't let the music or anything you use to help aid your creative setting. You cannot let that dictate the content of the work, or even the ability to work. I do find that it helps, and, and, I, and I choose the music carefully. But it, wasn't, it doesn't uh, actually uh, uh, create the stuff. This is a question I'm going to use later. Brian Kelly in San Diego asked, he says, I'm just beginning to write stories. My problem is keeping track of the thread after starting out. How do you integrate the day's writing with the previous day's writing so that the story has a direction? Well, Brian, when you go back over the webcast, you're going to see that um, when I come to the new day's work, I, for a long while, I go all the way back to the beginning of the story and read it through up to that point. And I, I do that aloud. You can also do it on written text. But I would say, if you're going to do that, you should do both. Because the reading aloud is a, is a good way to get back into the voice of either the first-person narrator or the third-person narrator. Because third-person narrators also have personalities. A kind of persona, and so um, that's that's the best way to get 
integrated back again, just to go back. And if you have, if you're blessed with a bad memory, uh, you'll have forgotten what you wrote the day before, and when you go read through it again, you also get caught up in your own dream as if from the outside, and then you get drawn into it, and you enter it, and you go, you, you take that back into the dream space for yourself. <clears throat> Uh, Donna asks, what night will you read the entire story through? Well, um, that's going to happen Sunday. Sunday night, November 18th. Is that right? Yeah. 16, 17, 18. Yes, 18th of November, 2001. The 17th session, I will read the story through at very near the beginning. And P.S. Will the site remain online so that the archives of the event will be available? Yes, uh, they certainly will. Uh, they're going to be here. Florida State University will maintain the site and all of these archives, all 17 sessions will be available for your reading uh, essentially forever. I remember remind you again to bookmark the site this site however so that you can be sure and find it easily and uh, also and I'm going to mention this a couple of more times as well we are at some point we will definitely offer the entire uh, experience on some sort of medium that you can actually own CD-ROMs or DVDs or VHS or all of the above. Uh, there will be the full experience available. And I suspect we'll even provide an edited version as well, a condensed and edited version. But uh, you certainly will have the opportunity to purchase the entire session, uh, the, you know, the entire project. Uh, on media that you can actually own right now and for the I mean the 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 way we will archive this will not allow downloading you can just go there and watch it but you can't download it and possess it but we will be providing an opportunity to purchase this whole project as well at some point in the future so keep this thing bookmarked and check in now and then Debbie Peters says Asked, do you ever start a story you fail to complete? If so, why? Uh, back in those bad old days of the million lousy words I wrote, there were some things I started that I didn't complete, but even back then I would complete them out of a profound mm, self-deception that they were good. Since I began writing well, I have found, and since I knew to, to look into myself and not begin writing without having a fix on the yearning of the character, and I think I made a similar answer last night, but it bears repeating. When I know the yearning of the character deeply, intuit the yearning of the central character, and I start to write, I have uh, I've almost never failed to complete the story. The why of not completing, if it happens, would be that I have lost a sense of the yearning. Because that's at the heart of it. Debbie also asked, do you consider every piece you finish right for publication? If not, why? Uh, yeah, I do. This, this, since I'd almost never abandon a story, if I finish the story, um, every short story I have ever written since I began writing well I have published somewhere except for the one except for one story and that was because it was 20,000 words long as really a novella and because it, I finished that novella uh, very shortly before the the book that it was going to be in 
this is a good sand from a strange mountain, and the novella was uh, the American couple. That never got published because uh, in, a, in a periodical it got published at the book because it's an awkward length. Most magazines cannot simply cannot publish a, a, a piece of fiction that long. The very few outlets that do, I just did not have time to deal with them because they have tend to have long lead times before the publication. They tend to be literary magazines, and some of those are a year or more before it could possibly appear in print. And this story was done about oh nine months before the book was going to be published. So that's the only time it's never ever happened. But look. I'm giving answers to your honest answers to all of your questions. And I want to emphasize that you should not feel intimidated. Please don't feel intimidated either by anything you've seen in this webcast. You know, I have been doing this a long time. And I promise you, I wrote more bad things than you will ever write. And the bad things I wrote I, I'd be willing to bet are worse than anything most of you have written. And if they aren't, that doesn't mean you're not going to write something wonderful someday. Please don't let anything here intimidate you or make you feel discouraged because I have written very badly and I wrote it, a lot of that stuff. And so I could, you know, I could say yes. I fail to complete stories, and yes, I write stories that I think are, are worthless and shouldn't be published, because I have. I have. The fact that since I found my way into my unconscious in an in effective way, that I've tended to publish everything I've written, that doesn't mean if you don't do that, you've failed or there's something wrong with you. Because if that were the case, I never would, I would not be sitting here before you now. I wrote five, count them, five god-awful novels and 40 terrible short stories and a dozen dreadful full-length plays, literally a million words of dreck before something happened and I began to write well. So please don't be discouraged by, by that. Uh, Christian Fierro says, Dear Mr. Butler, what I like the most in this internet adventure is that you have put yourself at high risk in front of us all. You could have failed. You could have written a bad story, a very bad story yesterday. It is clear to me now that good writing is not so much about technique, but about, I am not certain if this is the right word, but about courage from the part of the writer. The idea the dream of the goggles was great, it worked, your story, as the Argentinian writer Julio Cortazar used to say, won by knockout. Can you explain how did it occur to you again? Okay, thank you for those kind words, Christian. I could have written a bad story, you're right. Uh, God knows I was very nervous about that. These are conditions that I have never been in before. These are conditions that no writer has ever been in before. And uh, I did not know what would happen. But you know something, whatever courage I might have had to do this, it is um, just a tiny subset of the courage that all of you must have. And you're absolutely right, Christian. And I think I'm going to read this again because you're, you're, you say it well. It is clear to me now that good writing is not so much about technique but about courage on the part of the writer. Good, good technique flows from courage, Christian, because technique is the handmaiden to the vision. It's, technique is downstream from looking into that incredibly frightening, demanding, difficult, challenging place, your artistic unconscious, your dream space the white hot center of you and to go in there and not to flinch every day to have the courage to do that is absolutely the essential of becoming an artist so I'm, I'm glad you put it in those terms you're absolutely right now how did the goggles 
occur to me again. Let's let me see if I can let me see if I can trace that a little bit for you in a in a more precise way because I've, I've talked about this a couple of times, but there is still more to say. I think. And as you know, the goggles themselves came uh, the other night driving in, in the dark. I was open to my unconscious. And I think the train of association went like this. I was there. I was inside Paul's sensibility. And I saw him standing crucially in the very spot where Earl Sant had, had crashed and died. Then I was, I was in there with him and suddenly Matthew was there, his son. And I, and in a way, I was inside Matthew too. He was not a point of view character in the in the in the story. It was the first person in Paul's voice. But in the dream storm, dream storming, in that kind of trance, a free floating trance, you can shift into other characters easily as well. And Matthew, I understood from inside him, had come to this space in his child's way for a similar reason. And what would a child do there? I waited upon Matthew once I was inside him, waited upon him. And children, especially when a, this wonderful object has fallen from the sky and shattered, Children look around. They love to collect things. They get down on their knees and they, 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 you know, they pick up little things and they look at them. And, and then I knew that Matthew had found something of Earl Sands. The first thing I thought, though, I saw was that I knew I, I sensed it was some very personal thing. But the first thing that came to me was that Matthew had one of Earl's shoes, that his shoe had fallen off, flown off in the impact, and that he had a shoe. I first turned to shoes because it's a very personal object. Actually, my wife and I collect shoes. We were at the Victoria and Albert Museum several, some years ago, and what, four or five years ago. And they had an exhibition of shoes from the, all ages. And they were shoes that people had worn. And there was only one shoe of each type of shoe in the exhibit. So that the emphasis was thrown not, oh, well, here's a pair of shoes. It was a shoe as a kind of art object on one hand. And a kind of, but we, but Betsy and I both... Respond, we were very moved by this, by seeing these shoes. These objects were, spoke to us of, well, of mortality. These very personal objects had once been, you know, part of a, the body, as it were, of these people long since dead. And so we began to collect shoes in the antique stores and on the internet and so forth. And we have a wonderful collection of shoes, everything from a Civil War boot to a, one of those horrific Chinese foot-binding shoes to a wonderful wedding shoe from 1920. Kind of a cloth white shoe, long pointed toe, it was a big shoe. She was a big woman. And this is why we love the shoes, because, for example, on this shoe, it was a wedding shoe, and you could, you turn it over. Remember, this is in the 20s. You turn it over, and there's very little scuffing. And by the way, we only collect shoes of adults, 
people with matured personalities and shoes that have been used, have been worn. This shoe was not much worn. You could see that she had worn it once on her wedding night. But then you look and the scuff on the bottom of the shoe is circular. And all of a sudden, Betsy and I had a vision of her doing what? Dancing to Charleston, you know, where the, the, the sh your feet went like this in circles. She danced to Charleston on her wedding night. And you could see it in the object. Well, my thoughts turned to shoe, the shoe. But, you know, I had used, first of all, I'd used shoes before in a story. Back in A Good Sand from a Strange Mountain, uh, there's a, there's a story about a Vietnamese man called Relic, about a Vietnamese man who has collected a shoe, one of what he believes to be one of John Lennon's shoes. In fact, a shoe he wore on the night that he was shot to death. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be averse to using a shoe again in this story. But then I came to the goggles because of the organic nature of art. I've talked to you about motifs, the things that, the sensual things, the deeply patterned sensual things that return and return and return. And that an art object is organic, that everything within the art object is, uh, resonates into everything else. And as Matthew was there, and I was inside Matthew, I suddenly understood something, and that was that there was something within the story that I knew now was in that field and that Matthew had found, the goggles. The goggles had already come out, and I had no idea that the goggles would return. But if you remember, in, earlier in the story, Paul has a vision of Earl Sand across the field putting his goggles on before he took off on this flight that would, be, that would end his life. So then suddenly, yes, Matthew had the goggles because the goggles were then also suddenly quite resonant. They were the things as in, in the way that, that developed there. So uh, that's how the goggles uh, developed. Uh, Linda Carlson says, you've discussed the distinctions between writing the fiction of short stories and novels and writing a screenplay. Could you do the same in terms of writing a play? Well, it's similar, Linda, to the, to the differences in writing uh, screenplays in that plays are a collaborative art form. Uh, the, the playwright is not responsible for the final, ultimate, sensual object. All art objects are sensual things. They exist moment to moment through the senses and we access them through the senses and the moment-to-moment -moment sensual object that is a play is the performance of the play. The, the script of the play is like uh, the manuscript of a Beethoven symphony without the symphony orchestra to play it. And so the playwright must, like the screenwriter, create fruitful blank spaces in this object. Now screenwriting is much more visual oriented and less language oriented. Plays are still uh, uh, strongly language oriented. So that's the other difference. The playwright has a, a more central role in the object than does the screenwriter. And that role uh, absolutely involves the creation of language. As I said, the reason I was a bad playwright is that my most impassioned writing was going into the stage directions, which is a bad sign for a playwright. I was trying to control everything, gestures and posture and facial expressions and how a line is read and exactly the, 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 the set and all of those things. You've got to let that go as, as, a, as, a, as a playwright. You'll have to accept your limitation. You're there for structure and for dialogue. And even that's collaborative with the, with the, art, with the, 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 the um, actor sometimes. So that's the basic difference. Well, folks, we've reached the end of another session of Inside Creative Writing. I'm delighted that you've joined me. And uh, I hope you will uh, write any last questions you have for me 
and join me again on Sunday evening um, when we will have our final session with this story. And by the way, we don't have a title yet. We're going to have to think about that overnight. It's a pleasure having you with me, and I'll see you Sunday night. Thank you.